This is Alabama Politics with Steve Blowers, an in-depth interview with Alabama's top political newsmakers. Now, from the studios of Troy University, here is Steve Flowers. I'm Steve Flowers, and welcome to Alabama Politics. Folks, we have as my guest tonight one of my favorite young politicos in the state. Uh, he is an outstanding state senator. I've known him for years. He's still in his 40s. He's still a young man, and uh, He's been around politics 20 years, probably been around politics all of his life. Uh, those of you in the viewing audience from Troy uh, know Senator Cam Ward. He was a president of the SGA at, the, at Troy University when I was a state legislator. I've known him that long. Cam Ward is a great uh, leader in the state Senate. He's been uh, head of the uh, prison uh, reform efforts in the state for almost a decade now. He served eight years in the House and now in his ninth year in the state Senate. And he represents his home area of around Alabaster and Shelby County and uh, we thank Cam for being with us today. Cam's also a candidate for the state Supreme Court. Cam, good to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Steve. Good to be back with you, buddy. I've known Cam Ward since he was a young president of the SGA <laughs> at Troy University. You grew, see, you know, the thing about it is People, not many folks in Shelby County were born and raised there. But no, you were born I, and raised there. I, I was about 75% about, about of everybody in Shelby County was never raised there. But as you know what? It's a great place to live. I represent Shelby, Bibb, and Chilton County. Great place to live at. It's a conservative area. Well, it's 82% Trump country, so yeah, it's very conservative. It's a Republican district if ever was one. Yes, it is. Yes. You've always been a Republican, though, haven't you? you never... Oh, yeah, no, I've been a Republican all my life, and uh, I got reelected this last time in my district with 77% uh, of the vote in my general election, so it was a, it was a good election. Kim, you were young when you went to the House. How old were you? Uh, I was 30. That's how old yeah, I was. I was 30. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I started young, uh -huh. and today I'm 48. Although, it, when you serve in the legislature, like you know, it's like dog years. I actually may be 117 <laughs> years old, but it's okay. You know the thing about the legislature, when I left in 98, I've been there 16 years and left voluntarily. Nobody ever beat me. But uh, the best thing about it is people ask, me, what do you, it's the friendships you make. It's a lot of fellowship. You know, a lot of people want to criticize and talk about the legislature. And, you know, you get 140 of us, uh -huh. and you're going to get one or two bad apples that, that stain the rest. But at uh -huh. the end of the day, the friendships and camaraderie you make, as well as how do you get bills passed, which means you got to have relationships to how build with people. Yeah. And so far, uh, I've been, I really have enjoyed that. There's some great people I've had. Jabbo Wagner. I was going to just about this. Jabbo's a mentor of mine. Yeah, folks like that. So, that's that's the kind of stuff that's really uh, helped me in my career. You know, Jabbo's got his own little private Civitan club. Yeah. I'm a member of it. Oh, really? I go to the Vestavia Civitan club every third Friday, and, and uh, it's, it's his own little club. And we get the best guests, as you can imagine. We only meet once a month. Yeah. When he asked me to join, I said, well, Jabbo, I'll be in that club. I ain't going to sell fruitcakes on the corner and stuff like, like civitans do. You know, I ain't going to <laughs> <You laughs> <and the best, laughs> uh, run around the best yeah. so fruitcakes and people, you know, so you don't do that. But he has, like, you know, he's real big in the sports hall of fame. Yeah. And he has Doug Hallman. and all His basketball the career. Yeah. I mean, this, he's got a great career. You know, he and, uh, he and Jim Carnes are the same age. Carnes is close to Jabbo's age. I've been blessed, though, to have some of those guys as my mentors. Over oh, the they years. love you, yeah. Well, but they're great to work with, though. I mean, you uh -huh. learn, it's a lot of institutional knowledge. You talk about this a lot on your show and your uh -huh. columns where we have that institutional knowledge. You learn so much from people that have been around for so long. J Jabbo and Shelby are two of my favorites in the whole world. Two but good they, guys. But, but they both leaders. I, I mean, Shep, but they getting some age on them. Shelby's 85 and Jabbo's 81. So, but you know, you can tell your grandchildren about them. Well, they're great. They're just great friends. Uh -huh. you know? and, and, and sometimes we get caught up in politics, we forget about our friendships. You know, Jabbo and Carnes were good athletes in high school. Oh, yeah. Carnes Both was a running were. back at Woodlawn High School. I mean, if you look at the political leaders over time, excluding me, um, <laughs> I don't have a great athletic <laughs> career, but you look at Bob James. Yeah. Ran a running back at Auburn. Uh -huh. You look at Jabbo, his basketball career, Jim Carr. I mean, you see these folks, and that's a lot of the ways they built their career. Kim, you know uh, what I'm talking about football. 
I, that Thompson team's got to be really good, hadn't it? Thompson's great. I live two blocks away from there. Let me Do, tell I you wonder if you didn't live I close to there. I lived two. You were born and raised in Alabaster. No, I was not. No, 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 I was a late. I was a late bloomer there. Okay, but I, I'm there. I've uh, been there, of course, for a few decades. But I will tell you this: my daughter goes to Thompson High School. And, and I've been to a couple of the guys. I was there when they dedicated the new field. Uh -huh. Thompson High School is just setting it on fire. And it's, it's changed up. everything the way it has, the community has grown and rallied behind uh -huh. that team. Yeah, they're doing a great job. There's something similar to that going on here in Montgomery with Pike Road. Yeah. They've got, and they say people who don't have children or anything are going out to those games. That's impressive. That will instill a winning tradition. It does, and it changes the community. I mean, yeah. people really want to rally behind the community when they see that kind of spirit. Yeah. Thompson beats Hoover, don't they? Thompson beat Hoover, and they lost the Hewitt Trustful this past week. I saw that. But but I'll tell you, overall, yeah, they're, they're going to be in the playoffs, and they'll be a contender again this year. So you go out there and watch them. Oh, yeah, but, they're great. Yeah, but, but it's great, but it's uh -huh. fantastic. And the, and the spirit, you have a lot of folks that go out there has nobody playing in the game. They just want to go That's be part I've of the heard. community. Yeah. Uh, listen, Cam, you in, are you getting around the state pretty good in your Supreme Court race? Yeah, I was in Walker County, Pickens County I last week. Going to be back in the Shoals uh, this weekend. Was in Huntsville last weekend. What so just may, And then we're going to spend a lot of time in the wire. Going to be at the, in the Troy Homecoming Parade coming up. And then next week, we're going to be in Mobile all weekend. So we're working. It's been great. That's good. That's good. The Supreme Court's a good place for you. You know, there hadn't been many folks gone from the state senate to the Supreme Court. No. Not it, directly, it, have they? Not directly. Probably, um, actually, in the last century, probably hadn't had hardly anybody. Uh, I would say it's it's a good fit for me. I think I'm fair. It's chairman judiciary, which I've been doing That's for right. nine years. That's right. You've been chairman judiciary. For nine years, and, and I've enjoyed that role. But I uh -huh. think as being a chairman, I've had a chance to legislate and look at the law. And be fair to both sides when you when you pass law legislation. Kim, you know, uh, talking about that, uh, you were being valuable to other members of the Supreme Court. You understand politics better than a lot of them do, but you you will have served in two different branches. Uh, you will have made the laws for 19, 20 years, so they may come to you and say, "Well, there may be a controversial issue that y'all decide on the Supreme Court." And they may say, well, Cam, what was the intention here? Because that's the purpose of the Supreme Court is interpret what the legislature has intended it to do. And a lot of time that gets away from a lot of folks is, you know, the legislature writes the laws, the court interprets the law. Mm -hmm. But around the country you're seeing a trend where a lot of courts are actually rewriting the law. And you don't want that. But I, I think mm -hmm. that's what I would add to the... I would add to the court is that I could be somebody that says, this is what the intent was. This is where they were coming from when they did this and how the budget process works. That's always a right. big issue for the courts. And uh -huh. I, I think having that background serving on the budget committee and That's judiciary right. chairman, they would add something. They'll have, I'd be glad to have you over there. Cam, uh, the one issue that has uh, escaped everybody and, uh, and, and people, don't, it's not a popular issue, but you've got to be, your tip of your hat for being involved in it is the prison reform issue and the prison overcrowding issue, which is what I wanted to talk with you about because you've taken the lead in that issue from the get-go. Uh, and I believe in it. Give our, give our viewers, if you will, the history of where we got in this predicament. It's been going on for probably two decades now. But now you also are trying to do some prison reform issues to try to cut back on the recidivism and also, say if this guy sold a piece of marijuana or something, they shouldn't be incarcerated for ten years. And, and I think most yeah. of them, but that, that not just that, but tell me the, the the also the concept of where the governor is going to address it. And I wrote in my column a week or two ago that you and the governor were wise to not try to rush the special session because there's old adage that good facts make good decisions. You know, if you get all the facts. But what I got to also tip a hat to you and Governor Ivey for working with the Justice Department and conversely the Justice Department working with us. Yeah. Y'all are sitting down in the Justice Department giving y'all the guideline 
that if y'all do this, we're okay. Well, see, now my that wasn't true with Frank Johnson, George. No, Hunt. no. And see, my grandma had better at it. She said, you know, you want a good casserole, you got to let it cook for a while. Mm -hmm. And it's the same idea, and I agree with the governor. We, we should take our time on this. A few things. One, this started back Frank Johnson uh, in 1980 when, when they put us in receivership. And what happened was we had, I could change the dates on that order and the news articles and be the same thing today. Yeah. We're back in the same spot. So what do we do today to not go back into what happened in 1980? We didn't get out of receivership till 1989. Nine, ten years. I mean, that. it was a long. We don't want a federal. Did Johnson court. have somebody oversee that? They did. They, uh -huh. did. they did. And what you don't want is you don't want the federal court coming in and let, no. letting a lot of people out because the number one role of state government, in my opinion, is public safety. And if we let a bunch of people out of prison. That's the worst thing in the world for they public They did safety. that in California. They, they did that, and it's terrible, and they still have a mess from it. Uh -huh. So where we are today is we went from 200% capacity in our prisons in 2011. Today, we're at around 162%. percent we made per What's the key that we want to look at, 130 or you, you got to get around 137% uh -huh. is what the Supreme Court says. But you don't have to let a bunch of people out to do that. There's ways to get there. So some of the stuff we're working on in the governor's commission on executive um, on a criminal justice reform is this. One, you know what the number one thing is to reduce recidivism, the rate that people come back in? Giving them a job skill. So why not spend a little bit of money and make these people get a skill so when they get out, they get a job? Yeah. You know what? We have programs like welding, HVAC repair, plumbing, bricklayers, electricians, and guess what? Right now, our recidivism rate's 31%. The national average is 34%. But if you get a job skill while you're in prison, recidivism drops to 7%. You give someone a job, they don't come back to prison. And guess what? Liberals, conservatives, moderates, everything in between agree on one thing. What do you want when somebody comes out? I want them to get a job, I want them to pay their taxes, and I don't want them to hurt somebody. Cam, is there still a stigma if a guy does learn welding in prison or, or some skill that folks won't hire him because they're a convict? Yeah, I think that was the case when unemployment was higher. But because of Governor uh -huh. Ivey and, and folks uh, running the economy now, I will say this. I think there's actually, because unemployment is so low, there's a, people are begging us for job that they need people to hire. And there's not there's not enough folks in the job market. Mm -hmm. With the low unemployment, I think now's the time to enact some procedures to get these people a job. Who goes into the prisons and trains those people? Is it part of the, the, uh, the Greg Canfield's department, or is it, is it junior college? Well, I, I'm actually part. I'm actually the president of the of the foundation board for Ingram State Technical College. Uh -huh. Ingram State's sole job is to provide education programming inside the prisons. For all of the prisons. Mm -hmm. That's For out of Ingram. Maybe. That's right. And so what happens is, and, and of course that's Jimmy Baker over at the two-year college system, they're doing a great job. We increased funding by 30% for them this last time, and we're going to keep doing that to provide more of these jobs. These job training programs are getting people jobs. We're matching work with the private sector to make them go to work. We want everybody to go to work so they don't commit crimes. Did the community college budget itself go up 30% just that particular no, line No, just item. that particular line item, right. which is, but it's working. It's showing that if you put them in these programs, they don't come back to prison again, and that's what we all want. Now, so, uh, but but the the center for doing it is at, is at Ingram. Ingram State, but now they work in colleges around the state. All over yeah, them, yeah. huh? Uh, and they go into prisons and... And they partner up with other junior colleges, yeah. Well, do they do they keep the prisoners in the prison to train them, or do they take them out? No, we have training programs in different prisons. I, I've just finished touring Holman, uh -huh. uh, and I've also toured Donaldson. Saint, I've, I've been to every prison in the state, but St. Clair, Donaldson, Holman, and State are my biggest ones. And I can tell you, it's working. Those people don't come back if you give them a job skill. Cam, uh, now, from what I gather... Uh, and I think you and the governor are together on this. I'm hearing strongly that she was so successful last year in bringing the session, the special session on an issue like the rebuild Alabama 
was done within the parameters of the regular session. That's how you do this. Is that kind of what she's looking yeah, at? Yeah, but we, and I, I like it because, again, we go back to the casserole analogy. The one that cooks longer ends up being the best product. Uh -huh. I think we take our time. She, her executive commission is not due to report on January 1st anyway. Uh -huh. We go back into session that February. first week of February. So uh -huh. why don't we take our time? But we, you, you are going to have to isolate it, in my opinion. I think That's so. up to her, but isolate it. But I think there's a lot of stuff on reentry, prison education, diversion, addiction issues, and mental health. If we address those, man, that's that's going to be that's going to be the big issue for our prisons. But now we go out to have some new prisons, aren't we? You are. Here's why. So Judge Thompson said you got to provide better mental health services. But the problem we have is, if tomorrow I went out and hired a thousand new mental health workers for our prisons to comply with Judge Thompson's orders, where would they go? the current facilities won't hold them. There's nowhere to provide these services. If nothing else, you've got to construct these new prisons so you can provide these services that Judge Thompson's ordered. What do you give people like uh, psychiatrist offices in the prison? Well, well here, so mental health, by the way, the, the, the number one mental health treatment uh, organization in the state of Alabama is the prison system. We treat Within them, the system? Within the entire state of Alabama versus private sector, the state provides more mental health services because of, of our well, inmates. Well, you have psychiatrists or psychiatrists yeah. both. So right now, like under the court order, we have about 30-something percent, they say, are diagnosed mental health problems. Really, if you look at undiagnosed, we probably have about half our inmates have some sort of mental illness. And you got to treat that. And that's the underlying problem. They have a, their bipolar schizophrenia or our veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan have PTSD. So how do you deal with that? You don't have the facilities right now to do that. What do you put an office in the building for just You have offices, ward? yeah, you have offices, counseling centers. I've been to Tutwater a few times and it's literally they have a little closet in there they do it in. It doesn't work. You gotta you gotta provide more services so they can have space to work in. Well do they do you put the, the prisoners who've been diagnosed with mental health problems in a separate ward? That's something to look at. Yeah, that's something uh -huh. to look at. Well it depends on the diagnosis. Uh -huh. PTSD is very different, bipolar schizophrenia. Also, are they taking their medication? You know, a lot of times when somebody has a mental illness, they commit a crime, they have bipolar schizophrenia, they end up getting into an addiction to try to self medicate their problem. So if they're on their medication, they're fine, but if they take something outside of their medication, it creates further problems. Uh -huh. You've learned a lot about this stuff, haven't you? I've spent the last nine uh -huh. years as chairman uh, learning about it and working on it. And I, I, I enjoy it. It's a real problem. But it's something we can fix. And to be honest with you, it makes us public safety even better. Well, Cam, in the special session, and you agree probably the governor will, will do what she did last year and say, okay, on the state of the year. Go of into the, the regular, then call us into a special. Okay, yeah. just like last year. What issues have to be legislative issues and which can be executive? Can, I think she can she's do, heading toward prison. She can do construction with executive. She yeah. can do it, and mm -hmm. that's what she's probably going to do? Yeah, I think so. And, and it's smart because we've tried that three times. Uh -huh. What happens is you get into horse trading. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the years when Wallace and them did. Uh, you know, Wallace and them was pretty, pretty savvy. What they did was they would give you, either you got a junior college in your district or you got a prison. It was an economic development deal. But if you base prison construction on economic development, it, it's broken. It doesn't work. It yeah. just doesn't work. So what you do is she comes in and does it without the legislature. That's where we failed. We had folks. They need to be around urban areas. You know? Yeah, near interstate and also a hospital because you got to have treatment uh -huh. care. So, but then again, if you, if you had to do that by legislation, you're going to have a lot of we got horse You training. got one in Bibb County. I got one in Bibb. <coughs> uh, we got... Uh, and your Bibb. people may not get one in Bibb County. Uh, Billy Beasley and... Uh, His whole... That's the biggest employer. He, he got two of them. And then you got Jimmy Holly's got one. You know, you, all these guys who've been around, they're going, well, I can't lose... Particularly rural areas. It's a big economic deal. I so know. I think her doing that by executive order, us doing a legislation dealing with any kind of sentence from reform has got to occur, mm -hmm. uh, recidivism reduction, alternative programming, you do that through legislation. Is she going to go private, you think? And what she does is, no, you know, everybody assumes, no, private prisons, in my opinion, for the most part, do not work. I think what you do is the state needs to run any facilities we build. But I think the way you're, she wants to do it, though, is doing the lease back. Somebody private builds it, we lease it back and run it, is a much better option. Yeah. 
it's cheaper for us, and I think it's also much more efficient and gets done quicker. Are other states doing that? Yeah, Pennsylvania's a good case on how that was uh -huh. done. I think that's the model they're looking at, and it works. Uh-huh. Is it that we, we lease the building from somebody you, else? You just rent the house instead of own the house. Uh-huh. But you run it yourself. You run it, yeah. There won't be, uh -huh. no private company would run it. The, the state would run it. Uh-huh. So you wouldn't have any kickback from state employees. They actually no, like it. I think state employees would be fine with it. You wouldn't uh -huh. change their status. And we got to continue investing more money into hiring more officers and paying them more. You're right about that. If you get that in legislature, that's going to be a fight. Because anybody going to want to cut theirs out in their district. Well, what happens is, is I want to <laughs> fix this, but I want to cut it from this guy over here. <coughs> uh-huh. Yeah. This one is St. Clair. And I've tried it three times, and it just it, it, it you just can't horse trade enough on it. No. And you actually, you can horse trade yourself into a corner and find yourself in the worst situation you have already. It would be. Yeah. Because that's, Barber County is not the ideal place to put a prison. No, Barber Bullock just, it doesn't uh -huh. work. Uh -huh. you, you need close by highways, you need an urban area, you need hospital facilities. Do you know I was in the legislature when that last thing was done and Wallace was governor? And they did a survey. Uh, we had this big study group, and they came back like experts on where the prisons ought to be. We had the same problem, like you said, the same blueprint. And uh, Wallace was going to build a bunch of new prisons all the state for political reasons. And uh, they came back and said, Governor, they really ought to be put in urban areas because that's where most of the prisoners come from, mm -hmm. and their families can come see them, and you can have other things close by. And Wallace said, well, that sounds very good, but I think we're probably going to put those prisons in Barber County, if you don't mind. Votes, you're going to get some votes <laughs> well, that's out of it. Well, it's home county. It's, home, it's, yeah. it's a hard deal. It, it, here's the deal. If you want to make it work, we can't go through that horse trading again because if we do, we're going to be right back where we were the last time we got taken over. He bought a lot of land. That's one of the arguments about when I was there. And they would come to us and say, we're going to build these prisons in Barber, Bullock County. Hell, they bought half the county. Well, they did. To expand and, for future advancement, you know. And if you need economic development, the idea that government's got to put a bunch of facilities there to increase economic development, <laughs> just bad philosophy, in my opinion. <laughs> but you know what? That's my philosophy in 2019. may not have been the same thing in uh, 1980 or 81, 82. Yeah, you're right. It was like that was, that's not the best way to do no, it. No, it's not. It, long term, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh-uh. The growth in the state's going to be up around Huntsville. Yeah, Huntsville's growing big time. They are. It really is. You know, I've I've seen some things, uh, and Senator Shelby shared some things with me that Huntsville Cam may very well be not only the fastest growing and most prosperous place in the state and the South, but maybe the nation. Yeah, it could be the it could be the fastest growing, and economically. The jobs there, I spoke to the uh, Huntsville Rotary Club about two or three years ago, two years ago now, and there were three or four hundred men there and women, and I says, how many of y'all are PhDs? Half of them raised their hand. Yeah. It was half. And they're nuclear scientists, I mean, the, I mean rocket scientists, PhDs oh, yeah. and rocket scientists. NASA and all the defense contracts. It's yeah. almost like part of the Silicon Valley of, of it, California. It's the Silicon Valley of the South. It really is. Yeah. It's like a, it's, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Shelby's putting the second largest FBI facility in America in Huntsville. Yeah. That's what happens when you have seniority in the U.S. Senate. And chairman of the Senate Appropriation yeah. Committee. And want to exercise your power. And he does a good job of it. <laughs> he sure does. And you know he's a bright, he's the sharpest 85-year-old guy I've ever seen in my life. Oh, Works out sure. every day. And, he's, and he's, he knows the political system. No question. Sometimes people it. frown upon that, but I can tell you something. For our yeah. state and what he's done, it's helped a lot. He, you, it's unimaginable. He told me, Cam, and, and, and I guess you voted for the rebuild Alabama. I did, yeah. Yeah, that was good uh, because it, we really need to have something done. There are roads in this state haven't been paid since Big Jim Fultz was governor. But I asked some of those guys in Walker County, like Reed and Schofield over there in the, in the Sand Mountain area, they were for the docks being widened more than the mobile people were. Because Schofield said, my poultry farmers have got to have that port and, and reading them got to have it for coal. Shelby sat there, we had supper one night at Highlands and we were sitting there talking. And this, this just dawned on me. He told me five years ago, he said, do you know that port in Mobile cannot ship the Mercedes vehicles, cannot be shipped through there. Had to be dredged. 
It's got to be Dresden. It's got to be it'll wide. Be the big, it'll be the deepest port on the eastern seaboard. And so right now, for example, the Chinese send, and we have one of our largest trading partners is with the Chinese. They go in to the west coast. They go in California, and they rail or truck everything back and forth from California to us. Because our port's not deep enough, that deep port, would allow us to ship directly, not exactly. only to China, but to a other Asian countries uh -huh. because, and the match that Shelby and Trump are sending to us, this money will help. It's a huge economic it's boon It's over for half us. of it. It's a huge economic it's boon It's $50 million. For it's economic boon for us. Oh, no question. And people people were wise in the state Senate and legislature to realize that that's not Mobile's port. That's the oh. state's port. Oh, like you say, you got the coal, you got the uh -huh. cotton, the peanuts. Yeah. Go out. yeah, it's a great, it's, it's going to be a win for all of us. Yeah, it's good. But, but Shelby's coming up with a lot of federal money. He has, it's he's not done a good state, job. It's not just state money. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to be a heck of a thing for the state. That, that's going to be good for the whole state. You've got to have interstates. You've got to have roads, too. Oh, Especially you, in your area. Well, here's All the deal. that growth, you've got to have some. That's a bottleneck you, there. You can't run <clears throat> and, and keep up to date with the widening and the paving in 2019 on the same revenue source you had in 1992. No. People may not like that, but at the end of the day, you want roads? And Shelby County, let me tell you something. We got to have road widening. We got we got y'all got to yeah. there. It's just we grown so fast. And two eighty, you ain't got two eighty, but that's a that's but, a nightmare. But, but if you gonna pay to fix those roads, you gonna have to pay for it. It's not free. What is the answer to two eighty? People in the state look at the two eighty like they live. I rather live in Atlanta than the, drive the, that road. Yeah, it, the problem with two eighty is they have too many government jurisdictions. Between cities and counties, they have like nine different jurisdictions over uh -huh. 280. So no one jurisdiction gets along with the other. Bob Riley tried this in his administration to do a uh, elevated toll road. Yeah. And they all said, oh, no, no, we don't want that. But you can't widen it anymore because uh -uh. there's no it's way. Either you're going to have to do a uh, elevated road or you got to find another. There's just no way to widen. There's nowhere to widen that. Well, your people have got a problem. Is if you got a plan to resolve that bottleneck in uh, Alina and Alabaster. Well, one good thing we did on 65 was, or Aldot did, was they widened from County Road 50 to the Tank Farm exit uh -huh. we all know yeah. about uh -huh. down to the Alabaster Shopping Center area at 231. Uh -huh. So or 238. So we're making pro 65. If you can get 65 resolved, that helps so much. Now we still got other roads and. Obviously, I keep lobbying as hard as I can. Uh -huh. Al to make sure you take care of us. So that. if you if you do take care of 65, you can take care of 65 some of people. helps a lot of other areas. Uh -huh. Now you have some county roads in there, but the rebuild Alabama is already starting to put money in some of those road uh -huh. projects. You know, one of the best things oh, uh, K did was get Joe Bonner over there. He's fantastic. Let me tell you something. Uh, Joe and I have a unique history in that we both had, we both worked for congressmen at the same time. I worked for Bacchus, and he worked for Callahan. At the same time? Same time. And uh -huh. that's how I got to know Joe. That's how I got to know Steve Pelham. How yeah. I got to know uh, Leland. Who did Pelham Wayland. work for? Uh, Pelham worked for Everett. Oh, that's but right. We he all, was a, but he we was all, his AA. But we all worked together at uh -huh. the same. That's how we all got to know each other. So it's uh -huh. a funny, small world together. I, I saw Spencer the other day. How's he doing? He's doing great. He's practicing law again, enjoying himself. In Birmingham? Yep, I'm Birmingham, but he's enjoying himself. He's uh -huh. having a good time with it. Spencer and I serve in the House together. He, he, he served a term in the House. You know, so that? He served in the Senate first, then went to the House. That's because right. Because of redistricting, uh -huh. put him back in the House before he went to the State School Board. Yeah. I always liked old Spencer. He, he's doing well. He's, he's uh -huh. practicing law and enjoying himself. Uh-huh. I liked him. He did, he did a good job in Congress. I worked for him for three years. Uh-huh. Right out of law school? Yep. Uh-huh. Well, uh, take that back. Out of law school, now one of my dear friends who since passed away, I worked for Jim Bennett. I was a deputy AG, I was a deputy attorney general appointed by Pryor. Uh, worked for after Bennett, law school. After law school, worked for Bennett for a while. And in, the, in the Secretary of State's office? Uh -huh, worked for, I worked for the auditor and then the Secretary of State's uh -huh. office. Worked for the Secretary of State's office. You lived down here and do it? Oh no, uh -huh. I went back and forth to Alabaster. Uh -huh. I transplanted every day. Uh -huh. But you know, I was a pallbearer at Jim Bennett's funeral. Where are you? He was one of my dearest friends. I just he was I a quality guy. Could not admire anybody more. Quality you know, guy. one day I asked old Jim. He said he that that one of the hardest jobs he ever did was manage that office. You know that he was the longest serving Secretary of State in Alabama history. I know it. Because so he served ten years and then had two more after uh -huh. Bentley had him do the interim. I know it. 
Well, Cam, my time's up. It goes Thanks by her, doesn't me, it? It goes by her, doesn't it? Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Cam. Thank you. Folks, I guess tonight has been a state senator, Cam Ward from Shelby County, who's also a candidate for state Supreme Court. And we thank you, viewers, for watching. Hope you tune in again next week for Alabama Politics. Thank you very much.